Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today um, on the first session of our roundtable series on citizenship, social justice, and the collective empowerment, living outside mental illness. Our first session today is on the arts and social justice. It will be facilitated by Lucille Bruce, Romiel Perch, and our presenters today will be Liz Morgan, Shannon Smith, and Bob Forlano. Next slide, please. Um, and before we start, I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping informations with everybody. All of the participant microphones are muted. So if you do have any questions or technical difficulties, you can use the chat box. Um, and to open the chat box on the bottom of your screen, you should see the chat. And once you get to the chat, you will click on all panelists and attendees. That way, all of the attendees and the panelists will be able to see your message. If you do have any questions, again, you can use that chat box. This session is being recorded and it will be available on the MHTTC website Tomorrow, I will be emailing everybody who's here today with a link to our website and some post webinar information. And if you have any questions, you can always email us at newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. Our team is composed of the Yale Program for Recovery and Community Health, or PERCH, in partnership with C4 Innovations, Harvard University Department of Psychiatry, and the Center for Educational Improvement. The New England MHTTC, our mission is to use evidence-based means to disseminate evidence-based practices across the New England region. Our area of focus is recovery-oriented practices, including recovery support services within the context of recovery-oriented systems of care. Um, our mission is also to ensure inclusion, to ensure the responsiveness of our work. We will actively develop and maintain a network of government officials policymakers, system leaders, and other stakeholders within the, new, the, within the six states of the New England um, to guide our activities. And to learn more about us, you can visit our website. Again, this website will be sent in a post-webinar email to everybody. And with that, I will pass it off to Lucille. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to, to be here. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to thank Vanessa for your introduction and to everyone at the New England MHTTC and my colleagues at Perch, uh, Billy Brummage, Graciela Reese, and Maria Restrepo Toro. Um, it's really a privilege to be here today to talk about the arts and recovery and citizenship and social justice. Um, my name is Lucille Bruce and I am the communications officer at Connecticut Mental Health Center here in New Haven, which is a Yale-affiliated large uh, community mental health center. And I'm also a member of the Citizens Community Collaborative at the Yale Program for Recovering Community Health. Um, and just at the start, I wanna say, um, I hope my internet doesn't freeze up. I don't think it will, but if it does, uh, Liz Morgan from Theater of the Oppressed New York, who's one of our panelists, is going to jump in. So you're in good hands uh, today. Um, I really feel like this is a special gathering of souls, uh, and you are the people who would take an hour out of your, your day to talk about the arts in the middle of a global pandemic. So I know that you are special people, and I wanna invite you just to imagine that we're all sitting around a fire together, uh, just talking and telling stories, um, and it's gonna be a very informal conversation. I also, I really wanna acknowledge that we're having this conversation uh, at a time of crisis when, when many people are sick, and many people have died, and there are people dying um, even as we speak today. And uh, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that and to, to hold everyone um, in, in our thoughts today. Because uh, we've all been experiencing different kinds of losses, and over the past several months, we've also lost the ability to be together in person like we used to. So how are we all feeling? And that's just a, a question just to throw out to the group, not for answers, but just for you to think about. Uh, and as we experience loss and the kind of stripping away that has been going on for the last several months and even before, and all the discord that is happening in our country and in our communities right now, um, we might ask ourselves, what is left? You know, who are we? And I, I do want to suggest that the act of communication 
communicating itself is essential to our humanity and that the arts are a very powerful means of communication. So we have a very amazing panel of artists today who are gonna share their experiences with communicating on stage. And um, I wanna, before I turn it over to them, I just wanna to say there, so we have a theater artist from Theater of the Oppressed New York, Liz. We have uh, two people from a theater group that's based here in New Haven called Survivors of Society Rising. And those two are uh, Shannon and Bob, and you'll be hearing from them in a moment. Um, any conversation that we wanna have about mental health, the arts and social justice could be vast and uh, go on for hours. So today we're just gonna really focus on this one specific theater project as a way to take a, a deeper dive into the subject. Um, and I just wanna say as an aside, I would love to keep this conversation going. Um, after today's session, if anyone is interested in, in forming a working group on the arts and mental health, Maybe we could get back in touch with the MHTTC and see what we can do uh, about that. So thank you again for coming. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna screen share with you now just to give you a very brief history of the Survivors of Society Rising before I introduce the panelists. So here we go. Okay. So Survivors of Society Rising, as I mentioned, it's a theater group comprised of people in recovery from the New Haven area. It started in uh, 2016. Um, and this is a, this is a um, picture, not of the theater group, this is a picture of a couple of uh, visual art pieces that we have hanging in CMHC. Just to, just to, it's a slide just to acknowledge what I said before about there being all kinds of different arts and different ways to practice. This is, this, these murals were done in an art therapy group. And what we're gonna talk about today is not art therapy. It's something very different. It's real live theater making. Um, this is the very first show that we did in 2016 with my amateur uh, photo. We decided we wanted to make some theater because we wanted to hear people in recovery telling their stories on stage to, uh, uh, to an audience. And we knew of a group called Theater of the Oppressed NYC. Um, they are based uh, in New York City and our um, Liz can talk more about their work but we we partnered with them to come and work with our folks here in New Haven and this is a picture of Liz in rehearsal so these residencies that Theater of the Oppressed ran with our cast they were intensive three-day projects we did uh, three of them and um, a lot came out of this in terms of live theater performance and the stories are based on people's real life experiences. Um, so I'm just gonna sh flip through some pictures of, of this group um, in rehearsal. And this is Liz again, this is Al and, um, in a rehearsal before our, our third show, I believe. Um, this is a list that was generated in the theater uh, rehearsals. It's a liberation list of people's uh, desires for their lives, which uh, I'm hoping that, that Liz can talk about and others can talk about as well. Um, again, with the idea that these are true stories that we're working with. So the second year that we did this, uh, the residency with Theater of the Oppressed NYC, we partnered with our local International Festival of Arts and Ideas, and we sold out two houses, uh, both standing ovations. This is the cast from, from that particular show, um, and that really kind of launched us into, uh, I think, another uh, level in terms of our ability to share and perform in front of a wide audience. Um, so these are some scenes from some of the, uh, the scenes that people created in the plays. Uh, this is Bob, and he can maybe talk about this scene. Bob here on the right, and Richard Ewens, who's also a co-producer. Um, this is Shannon at our outdoor show on the green. This is, a, this is a, sh a picture showing some audience participation, which is part of the Theater of the Oppressed process. This is a curtain call. And after we had done um, three residencies with Theater of the Oppressed in New York, we were invited by Long Wharf Theater, which is our local uh, regional theater here in New Haven, to perform on their um, main stage. 
And that was a different uh, process. That was one that we went through last year, not using theater of the oppressed directly, but I think that everyone in the cast would agree that theater of the oppressed was really their foundation in creating that show as well. Um, and th that was a, also an amazing process. This is a picture of the cast and many of the Long Wharf Theater professional staff. This was a rehearsal in the beginning of that process, which was a, um, happened again last spring, 2019. All these pictures for, uh, very uh, make me nostalgic from the, for the days when we could make theater together in person and not worry about masks and social distance. Um, it wasn't so long ago. This is the final current call for that Long Wharf show. And um, I just want to show you as a last thing. Um, oh, sorry, I got to go back to that slide. Where's my link? I'm not seeing my link. I, I want to find uh, this video that, um, that Long Wharf created. It only takes two minutes, but it's a good. Um, you can just click on it, Lucille. Right here? Yep. Oh, okay, great. Okay, thanks, Vanessa. Here we go. This is a video that Long Wharf made about the project. And so you're gonna see some of the people in our cast. And uh, also you'll see a few young people and they were part of a different theater project at Long Wharf. Um, they are refugees who are living in the New Haven area. So this is, this is the New Haven Play Project from 2019. seasons just as people you know what I mean there's so, they have so much life experience that within itself to me is brilliant you know a lot of us are in recovery but reality is everybody is in recovery from something you know I mean it's a complicated world I can only see good things coming when people allow other people to have the space they need <laughs> It's about all of us. Yeah, this is my first time with theater. I, when I think of theater, I think like uh, being uh, the best version of yourself. The New Haven Play Project is a way of creating a broader understanding of the city we live in and creating space for people to fully be themselves on stage and to express the, the full breadth of humanity on the Long Wharf Theater main stage. Otherwise, we all clap together. Ready? <laughs> Okay, I hope you all um, were able to see that and uh, get a feel from the slides and from the video about what we're what we've been doing here. Um, so let's see. I'm trying to see. I think I'm off the screen share now, right, guys? Can you see my face? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so so now let me turn it over to to Shannon, Liz, and Bob and um, and ask them, I'm gonna ask you guys to introduce yourselves and to answer this question. Um, and the question is, uh, why is it important for people in recovery to make art? So, Shannon, would you like to start? Just make sure you unmute yourself. Hi, um, I'm Shannon Smith. I'm a part of Survivors of Society Rising. Um, I was introduced to theater by Lucille, through Lucille, and Liz Morgan, who is a phenomenal instructor patient kind of but phenomenal yes um i feel it's important for people in recovery to do art because you can express yourself more in ways outside of yourself i don't know if that makes sense like you can do it through poetry through re even reliving an actual event because sometimes live reliving that event brings out more of an emotion and people can kind of gravitate towards that and really see what the what the hurt is from, what the problems are coming from and things of that sort. Um, it's, it's not for people to understand you. 
it's for you to understand yourself better. So yeah, I think it's very important that people sh should at least give it a try to just step outside what they are or where they are and express themselves in a more artful form. Beautiful. Thank you. How about you, Bob? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob. I've been part of the Theater of the Oppressed and Survivor of Society since both of them asked us to uh, be part of the artwork since 2016. I'm really glad that um, Lucille had asked me to become part of the group to see if I was interested. At first, I was uh, really, really afraid to go on stage, talk, or anything like that. Um, but then I took a step back and I thought about myself and saying, well, I, you know, I'm doing better now. I, I do talk to one or two people about my illness and that I am doing better and that people can work again and do other things again if they do have a mental illness. But, you know, you can only get your point across to so many people that you talk to. And this was an opportunity to do something bigger than myself um, that we were all able to uh, do together as a team and express ourselves to a lot of people, a whole audience, that maybe they'll talk to somebody, and they'll talk to somebody. And I thought to myself in the back of my head, maybe this will get the stigma uh, reduction in people's minds less and less faster in the world, you know, at least in our little part of the world. And uh, right from the beginning, uh, after, after Theater of the Oppressed came and I did the first season of acting, from the first class to the very last before there was a show, from the whole process to the activities to learning. It wasn't like an, an acting class. It was like a whole learning process. And it was so enjoyable and, and uh, exciting to be part of it. I was hooked on it. And I, and I just couldn't wait until the next year. I was saying, Lucille, are we doing that acting class stuff again? And uh, when she told me that we were, I was just so excited to be part of it. Um, nothing but uh, happiness and joy came out of that for me. And I see a lot of people in the audience that went to a couple of those shows. And it was doctors that I knew from CMHC, clinicians, friends, family members, strangers would come up to me and say, wow, you really made uh, you know, an impact. I never thought about that happening to someone with mental illness. And it did happen. And I said, you know, this is what happened to me or this is what happened to someone. So, like Shannon said, she couldn't have put it any better that, you know, a lot of the skits that we did were from our own personal experience. And um, I'm just glad that I would be able to be part of it and something bigger than myself. And I really appreciate that. Thank you, Bob. I, 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 I really, what you said, I, I, I was approached by so many people who had been in the cast asking me, make sure you call me next time you're doing that. I'm going to be, I'm going to do that again. We never had anyone drop out until the last 2019. There was one person who's, I think whose life became a little overwhelming and couldn't finish. But other than that, everyone's uh, finished all the way through all projects. So Liz, why don't you um, go next and introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Liz Morgan. I use she, her pronouns. I'm from an organization, as they said, called Theater of the Oppressed NYC, where I am a facilitator. We call it being a joker. Um, and then I'm also the director of training and pedagogy. And yeah, I've done this project in, at New, in New Haven uh, with these five people for, for three years. We took a break last summer and then of course this past summer because of the, the pandemic. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just such uh, an incredible project for me for several reasons. I was baptized in New Haven, went to church in New Haven uh, before I left for school. And um, yeah, my father trained in New Haven. Um, so yeah, I just have a lot of connections uh, to, to that city and to, to the people. So it's just it's incredible to see y'all, even if it's on uh, this video chat, this, this video webinar. And to, yeah, to answer the question of, yeah, why, why, are, why do the arts um, when you're in a recovery? I feel like the first word that comes to mind is healing. Right, I think it can just be really healing to tell your story. Uh, and the, the truth about that and my, my experience of it is, is technically theater of the oppressed was not created to be drama therapy and that's not my expertise, but I think it, it does have that effect. Uh, but what I, what I will say about my expertise is it's in creative advocacy and facilitating spaces where folks can creatively advocate for themselves. And I think that was, the power and the work that we did to have 
doctors, like Bob said, that, that could see, see folks and hear folks tell their stories about how the system isn't working as well as sometimes we think it is, even when you know, you're in a position of power and you think you're doing the right things for the, for the communities that you serve. And then you see somebody saying, you know what, like, here, here is this problem that I'm having getting what I need. Uh, and I think there's so much about substance abuse and recovery that can feel really limiting. And I'd say, so I think engaging the brain creatively helps us think about creative problem solving in all aspects. And I think there was someone on that intro video that said, we're all in recovery from something. And so I think Theater of the Oppressed is obviously great for folks in, in recovery, but it's, it's, I think it, it's, it's great for everybody. Um, so that's, that's my plug for my work. <laughs> well, can you tell us, a, a, just to give us a quick summary of what Theater of the Oppressed is and why specifically do you start with stories of oppression? Mm, absolutely. What does that, what does that even mean, you know? Yeah, yeah, what, what is oppression? Uh, so Theater of the Oppressed was started in Brazil by a man named Augusto Boal. Uh, and he was, he was watching uh, the, the oppression of these landless farmers. And he was, he was watching them being taken advantage of um, and, and basically saying that they needed to, to start an uprising against their, their landlords um, who, who weren't giving them um, the right to their, their, their land. And so at the, at the end of this performance, um, you know, he kind of says like, and let's rise up and fight. And, and the, the folks that he did the show for, he was telling their story and they said, oh, okay. Like, you know, if, if you, if you think we should go fight, uh, let, let's, let's go fight. And he was like, oh no, we, we don't have any guns. These are prop guns. And they were like, well, that's okay. Like, we have real guns in the back, like, come, come with us, come, come fight this fight with us. Uh, and he was like, you know, you know what, I, I don't, I don't know that that's really for me. Uh, um, and they were like, well, well, then you're full of it and you should get out of here. And so he, he took that experience being kind of a, a more traditional director in Brazil and really rethought about uh, his pedagogy and his practice and came up with Theater of the Oppressed, where the folks who were closest to the problem would also be closest to the solution, right? The, he would engage people in stories about their real life. They would uh, do a play where you could see a person trying to get something that they needed, something that they had a right to, that liberation list, that's what that was, us drafting what the things that we know that we have a right to, but we're not getting. But then you would see the play end in failure. You would see the protagonists not getting this thing that they need. Uh, and then the joker, the facilitator, turns to the audience and says, well, well, think about this problem. And if you were in the shoes of this protagonist, what might you try to get what you need? And that process isn't about blaming the victim, but about us doing this creative problem solving together so we can start thinking interpersonally, institutionally, even internally about how uh, we aren't getting what we need. So that's really my, my definition of oppression. Uh, a person that, that has a, a right to something being denied that right by, by external systems uh, because of who they are uh, or who the system thinks they are. Great. Did I answer the question? <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and the cast members maybe can, can elaborate on their experiences with, with doing that on stage. Um, Bob, why don't I start with you? Um, so you've been in every show since 2016. And I, I just, I want to know why do you keep coming back? What, what, why, why, why do this? Well, I think I'm far from an actor to tell you the truth, but what I do <laughs> for is to try to give the audience something to, uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, when I first started, like I had said, when I introduced myself, um, you know, I was afraid, but you know, after the first time we got together, everyone that was going to be participating in it, um, we became friends a little bit. And then we did an activity or a little bit of a game or something like that. We became friends a little more and a little more. And by the end of the time, when it became to be the show, I mean, we were all striving for the same thing, to try to get each get to have a point and get it across. And kind of like Liz said, well, um, you know, what I wanted to do at the end of all those skits is to have people um, open their minds a little and the audience to have uh, something to think about and, and open their minds, think about and talk about with each other when they go home. Of, of what they saw there tonight, you know, what they absorbed, and hopefully they absorbed, absorbed something that they never thought or, or seen that way before, you know, so. 
Um, and and when it got when it got down to the next year, I said, "Wow, it was so interesting and fun. I made so many friends. So many people had nothing but positive things to say. Um, it, it gave me a sense of strength too, because now I wasn't just saying to myself, "I'm feeling better." I want to talk, okay, to my mother or father saying, yeah, I'm feeling better, or cousin. I'm talking to the world to me. The audience, when I was uh, on stage, I felt like I was talking to the world. And I love the way that uh, with the theater of the oppressed, you know, I never learned any way like this. We do a skit or two, but yet the audience would get involved and have to open their mind and answer questions. Liz would go around and say, well, what do you think? And then they would have to really use their minds. It wasn't just sit there and maybe learn a little from us, but they opened their minds and they really got involved. So it was such a such a, a learning process for me that I can't explain. Each year that I did it, it was such a learning process and I felt rewarded each year that I did it. And uh, I miss everybody when the show was over that I didn't see. And the following year we got together and it was like we weren't even a part. Hey, um, so Bob, when you, I showed that picture of you in one of your scenes uh, where you're, where Richard's standing behind the piano and you're you're talking to him. Do you, do you want to just say a couple words about what that scene is about? Yeah, that scene was about um, uh, a couple years ago at Yale New Haven Hospital when, the, when they didn't let anybody into the hospital actually. And, and so I you know, like wanted to uh, see a doctor or possibly admit myself. It wasn't for detox, but I was having uh, psychological problems and issues. Because well, you can't come here. You aren't, uh, you aren't on anything right now. Um, you can't come here. You aren't drinking right now. We we can't let you in, you know. And so there was no way for them to see me, talk to me. Or, it was just like I wasn't being heard, you know. So I was saying, what do I have to do? Go out and get high before someone could see me psychologically, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it was just like, and doctors were there and saw that. And after that, one or two doctors did come up to me and say, did that really happen? And I said, yeah, seven years ago it happened to me, you know. And uh, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't fathom it. And that made me feel. Not great in a way because I had to open myself to it and I was afraid. I had a lot of anxiety uh, to do that because that was one of the ideas that I had and we did put it together as a skit. But to have the doctors come up to me afterwards and question me about it, you know, and then after I thought about it for a couple of weeks, I was like, no, that was a good thing. That was really good that they came up to me and asked me, was it really like that? Because I thought they were going to be hypocritical with me, but they were with the system. You know, and they were part of the system, but they were hypocritical to the system. So that really, really made me feel good. Yeah, that that's really, that's a great example. And I think um, kind of following that, um, Shannon, there is a clip in the video that people saw of your, your scene at Long Wharf where the hospital scene. And um, just by way of uh, giving another example of the kind of work that you guys have done. So tell us about that scene and how it came to be. And also what changed for you in the process of doing that scene? Because I know it was a hard scene. So tell us more, tell us about it. That scene, um, it's weird because when I got in clean, that's what I did. I went into the hospital um, claiming suicidal and homicidal thoughts. And you know, it shows the, especially if you've done it over and over and over again, because when you deal, when you, when a person has co-occurring disorders and they think they may be ready to get clean, they'll do anything just to get that foot in the door. Not only that, if it's winter time and they need someplace warm to go, they'll do anything to get their foot in that door. So I have done that throughout my addiction many times, many, 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 many times. So every time I got into the hospital, you say you suicidal or homicidal, they can't let you go. But they don't want you there either. You see what I'm saying? So this time I was really ready to get clean and I went into the hospital. If I don't get admitted, I'm killing you, I'm killing your mother, I'm killing your unborn baby, and I'm killing myself. Whether or not I was serious, it got me to where I needed to be. And in the process, so doing that, it, it did stir up a lot of emotions. I don't know if you remember that after that skit really took off the ground, I started having like panic attacks every five minutes mm -hmm. at Lord work. And like that really, it did something to me, you know, it really did something to me. Like it, 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 it stirred up feelings, those feelings that I felt, but kind of intensified them. 
you know, I mean, because this time it worked. All right. But then again, I have to think about who I may have screwed up in the long run in the process of doing. It. So um, what it did for me is I had gotten clean. I graduated college from substance abuse, but for substance abuse counseling. But after that, did I graduate the same year? Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I graduated the same year and it made me want to go back to school so that I could become an advocate for people. Like right now I start class on Sunday. My class starts the 26th, which is Sunday for criminal justice. And I'm only going to school for criminal justice to get some idea of the law because I know substance abuse. I know mental health. I know that inside and out. So let me get this last part put to it so I can be an advocate for people so that now you're coming, you're be hospitalizations or, or the judicial system. Stop punishing them for what's going on up here. Stop. Treat what's going on up here. And then maybe everything else will stop. Everything else will fall into place. I don't ever, I don't know if you ever heard, you kill the head, the body will follow. You treat the head, the body going to follow. So, you know, theater, uh, the theater of the press and the other group, um, survivors of society right? <laughs> it brought they those things they brought me to another realm they elevated me to a different realm to not be so selfish and so so self-centered to be able to look at things and look at people in a different light and maybe even make that comparison to wow that was me and be able to look for ways to help myself along and help them as well um it's a great experience because like Bob said, it's bigger than me. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than me because I'm speaking for those that can't speak for themselves. Okay. One of my skits was um, the dude, the boy, he came out of jail, convicted felon, couldn't get a job because he had a, a felony on his record and they discriminated against him. All right, that's not fair. Give him an opportunity to redeem himself. All right, he, he, paid his, he, he paid his time. He did his time. So why are you still holding him accountable for something he already paid for? So, I mean, like, it just, it just made me want to do more for others and for people like me. And I'm going to end with this. I wrote a, a speech in college called We Are People Too. And basically that speech was telling you, don't judge me. Don't judge me. You don't know what it took to get me here. You don't know what I suffer from. So don't just because I have on tattered clothes and my fingernails are dirty and my shoes are worn down, don't peg me as being this. Because believe me, I may not be. And that's what everybody needs. That's what people need to think about when it comes to people with co-occurring disorders, people with just mental health disorders and things like that. You know what I'm saying? Just give me an opportunity. Yeah, th uh, thank you for for sharing all that, Shannon. And that that, you know, having watched uh, you and Bob over these years, I've really seen this incredible uh, work that you've done. You know, it's been really, really strenuous work and hard work. And I think listening to you talk, you know, some people might say, well, maybe that was uh, maybe we don't want people to have to to relive the things that are traumatic that they've gone through. But you, you just said the exact opposite. Something about doing it on stage you know, actually enabled you to transcend um, your, your situation and kind of move your life to a new level, which is so uh, powerful. I want to talk for a minute about, have us talk, all of us talk maybe a little about conflict, because I think we, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking that art is supposed to be this beautiful, harmonious, easy thing. And I, my experience has taught me that it's really one of the hardest things and the most rigorous things that you can do. And in the rehearsal process, we did see conflict. We saw differences, we saw disagreements, we saw personality clashes and all that. And I just wanted to, to get you guys to, to reflect a little bit about that and how you, what's the value of struggling through something with other people um, and how you um, got through the trouble. And maybe Liz, I don't know, you, you, you were the director of this ensemble for three years. So maybe you could just give us a, a few thoughts on that. And then I'll, Bob and Shannon as well. 
Sure, yeah, and I'm I'm certainly not going to go into details because for me, all of that stuff is long gone. I don't even remember. <laughs> I'm old now. Um, but, <laughs> but what I I think what stays with me about all of the conflict and you know I'll, I'll be transparent. I don't I don't have great things to say about our current carceral system. You know I don't I don't think it it benefit. I mean, and Shannon already spoke to this. Like it's it's not that's that that's not justice in my opinion and so folks leave prison and the idea of reintegrating back into society like that like prison isn't giving folks like the the tools to deal with conflict um and it's, it's exacerbating the, the worst in, in folks right and so i think there's something really special about when conflict happens in rehearsal because it's in a place where the conflict is okay can feed into the art making and and to say like look like we can we can have a a, a fight friday afternoon or an argument friday afternoon and come back saturday morning have a productive conversation with it and still work together like i, I feel like that's that's so beyond what so so many people are taught is is what's real um when they've been in prison and so i think because that was the story and that that's the background that a lot of the folks um, that were participating in the program are coming from. I'm I'm just I'm really excited when a conflict happens because it's an opportunity to say, hey, there, there's another way of doing this, and let's all learn together how to do this. Um, despite maybe coming from very different places, let's figure out what the commonality is so that we can speak to the world about our humanity. Um, and and yeah, and and build build a larger community. That's great. Bob, do you want to do you want to talk about this uh, theme of conflict? Yeah, I think I've seen it like uh, go on at, in our acting with other with different people that are in the group, and it's nice to see that that all in all, I'll just go from the beginning to end. It's nice to see all in all, like uh, Liz just said, that it that it isn't on the street and it isn't end up with violence and all, but it can be. You know, you can agree. You don't have to agree with what you hear, but just listen. You know, and you may not still agree, but we could still be friends. We could still have our own opinions, you know, and, you know, it might be over, uh, might be over the silliest thing, but yet it turns to be so violent when it's out in the world. And in our group, you could see people, have been, we've been, we've, I've been in fights on the, you know, that are real fights. And then you come in and you see that you, you get in that, that uproar and you see that there's no reason to be like that. You get taught almost in the, in the, Theater of the Oppressed and stuff like that. A lot of the classes that we did and uh, some of the stuff that we did, relaxation and different things that we did as a process for everybody that really helped if we were getting uptight or one-on-one -on -one person was starting to argue with each other. We all got into that together and became one again. And then after that happened, we started doing the class or, or uh, whatever we were doing uh, before this whole situation started. Rose. But I like how we did breathing techniques. We did uh, classes together. We did different, uh, you know, we got together with different four or five people, did different skits. Then we got together. It was just all involved, everybody. And by the time you were at the beginning of the, the first day of the group to the last day of the show, I mean, we just bonded like one. We were all there for one specific purpose. And that was to try to show stigma, prejudice, uh, discrimination. I mean, all of that happens. Uh, yeah. mental illness or substance abuse, dual diagnosis. It happens every day. It's still happening. I'm glad that we're trying to make a little a little chip out of a, a huge mountain, but, you know, it's going to take, you know, years. Yeah. Do you, um, do you want to sh add anything, Shannon? Or I, I should say, like, this wasn't like the predominant theme of the group. It's just with these flare-ups every now and then. So I don't want people to get the wrong impression. But if you want to add a, a couple, just for a minute. <laughs> Lee, I appreciate the way John and Liz handled flare ups and especially how Liz, that was her name, right? Yeah, handled the flare ups because it wasn't like they were condoning it. Like she said, it's okay. What are you going to do different? How can we make this work? And, like, I'm not. A lie. I was probably the main one that had the flare-ups. 
Not, not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> you always <laughs> moved us forward, Shannon. <laughs> but, you know, you learn something new every time. You know, because they had a way of making you take a step back and thinking about why you were flaring up. And 10 times out of 10, it was no reason for you to be flaring up. You know, so you're always learning something. And, you know, as reluctant as I am to say this, I have met some beautiful people who I still acknowledge to this day behind Theater of the Oppressed behind Survivors of Society Rising. And I can honestly say it really made me a better person. It really made me a better person. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for, for going there. I really appreciate it. I know it's quarter to three and we don't have a lot of time, but maybe Liz, could you, I, I wanted to give people a little hope that even though we're in a global pandemic, there's still art making going on. Um, in the world. And maybe if Liz could just give us like a minute or two on what theater the oppressed, the oppressed NYC is doing um, virtually, and then we can maybe see if we have any questions from the audience. And I'm so excited that we have people from all over the country here joining us. It's pretty cool. So anyway, so Liz, what, what are you doing on um, virtually? Yeah, I mean, and we we had a, a tough decision to make in March or April, and we decided that we were still going to keep gathering. Uh, we started on Google Hangouts, and then we moved to Zoom. Um, and and we've been creating Zoom theater, which is like it's a it's sort of a, a brand new genre that lots of folks are experimenting with. And actually, um, because I'm such a, an artist, I actually kind of wanted to sh to show versus tell, or at least show and then tell. Uh, so one of these games, and I know Bob was saying he loved the games, uh, a game that we uh, would usually do in person called Homage to Magritte, uh, referencing Magritte's paintings. He has that painting of a pipe, but in French it's called This Is Not a Pipe. Uh, he also has a painting of an apple, that, and again in French it's called This Is Not an Apple. So we would play this game that we would often call uh, This Is Not a Water Bottle. And on Zoom, um, it's kind of a this is not an anything. And so if, if my other friends here that are on the Zoom screen, if you have any object next to you, and I'll, I'll show you how this works, you're going to grab the object. So right now I have a pen that's next to me. And I'm going to say, this is not a pen. Uh, this is a, and then without filling the sentence, you're gonna, you're, I'm going to show you what it is, and you're going to tell me what it is. So this is a mustache. Perfect, Shannon. So that's, that's one of the games that we, we've been playing. Does anyone else want to take a turn just to? I, I got it. Awesome. So that's not a remote control. It's a hot dog? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, Bob or Lucille? You have Come anything? on, Bob. You know this. Okay, we have another pen. This is not a pen. This is a cigarette. Cigarette. <laughs> Amazing. So, so yeah, that's just one of the activities that we've been doing to sort of open up our mind to what our our home space, which you know, for everyone, I think home space has felt really limiting. Um, but there is a lot that we can do to start to tell story. Um, so at Theater of the Oppressed NYC, we we have a play that we used to do in person. It takes place on the subway. Um, and then on Zoom, we were like, well, how do we create a subway? And so we were thinking about the, the subway handle and what in our home looks like a subway handle. And we discovered, oh, we could use uh, the rod of the shower curtain. And so we would like, you know, set up our Zoom screen in the bathroom, rock back and forth to pretend that we were on the subway, add sound effects, uh, and find really exciting ways to, to, to use our screen. Um, earlier, like Shannon, you would come really close to your screen and that can be somebody looking through the, the peephole if someone's knocking on their door. So we're, we're taking, we're, we're borrowing things from, from theater, we're borrowing things from film, we're borrowing things from, from radio plays, because um, we, we have some folks that are, aren't using the video for Zoom. Um, they're using, they're, they're just dialing in. And so we, the first play that we made was actually just about phone calls and people calling 311 to try to figure out uh, where's my food, where's my package, um, how do I access uh, my, my benefit. And all of that was just phone calls. So it was basically a radio play, but we still had audiences on Zoom do that same part of the forum, interacting, stepping in. Um, 
So it's, it's really been a whirlwind, um, but I think we've discovered that uh, all those same tools of being creative and solving problems, being apart, being socially distanced is just another problem for us to creatively solve. Uh, and so I, I just wanna encourage everybody who's listening um, to, to, to try not to think so much of, um, of this whole Zoom or Ring Central or whatever app that you're on as, as a block to what you're doing, um, but uh, just a, another hurdle to overcome because it is, it is possible to keep creating art and I think it's possible to keep building connections and, and maybe we'll be building a, another residency uh, with my friends from New Haven soon. Yeah, that's that would be so amazing. Um, and thank you. It's pretty impressive what TONYC has been doing. So you could go to their website and and check it out. I, I'm seeing a, one question here in the chat. Um, it says in the book, the body keeps the score. The writer talks about one of the values of theater, especially for people who have experienced trauma as a way to quote, try out different ways of expressing oneself, unquote, that you may not have had the opportunity to try out before. Did any of you experience this? I think that's Shannon or Bob, Shannon? Yeah, the trauma, I mean, my skin running into the hospital, getting medicated was traumatizing. It's always traumatizing, but, um. I mean, a person has to feel comfortable with what traumatic issues they want to put out there. You know, you have people who've dealt with sexual trauma that may not want to be living on that level. I, for one, don't. All right. Um, you have, I have trauma of my mother dying. That's not something I would want an audience to see. So you have to be really careful with what type of trauma is being looked for. And, and you have to be ready to assist that person because they're reliving all of that. Or I mean, like the anger, the, the, the hatred, the, 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 the abandonments, the, I blame myself for being raped. If I wasn't out there, I wouldn't have got raped. You understand what I'm saying? So you gotta, I shouldn't have put that much out there, but it's okay. But, um, you got to be able to, you got to be able to support that person because if you do, if you relive a traumatic event, now you got to deal with that person from step one all over again. Mm -hmm. And that, that might not be a good thing to do. Like, especially on stage, especially not knowing if you can trust that person, not necessarily with your secret, but still treating you the way that they treated you. Because now you know this about me, you may treat me differently, which is going to cause me to hurt even more. So like, you got to really be careful about what you put up there and the level of trauma it caused you with the level of trauma it caused you. Yeah, I think, I think that's really well said. And it makes me think of something else for, that's been really important for me about this group, which is that it, it really has been your choice to participate, to tell your stories, to figure out which stories you want to tell. Um, it, it really has from the, from the beginning to the end been, been about you and, um, and your decisions. And so it's really, I think, I hope, reinforced your sense of power and agency in your own lives. Um, that, that has been a big part of the, of the goal, I think. And I, and I do want to add that you're amazing actors, all of you. So you don't know watching these shows who has experienced what the audience would never know um so and do we have any more um questions i i, I shannon well, i just want to ask you because we talk a lot about citizenship and recovering citizenship and mental health do you, what are your thoughts on how theater and survivors of society rising connects with citizenship well it connects with citizenship because I don't know, it, it, it includes. When you're a citizen, you feel a part of. You feel a part of something. You feel a part of something more than who you are and what you are. Um, I know I was um, co-facilitating. I worked closely with Bridget Williamson and um, Patricia Benedict for um, Citizens Project. 
And in the Citizens Project, we advocate to rights, roles, responsibilities, resources, and there's another R that I just forgot about. <laughs> and um, and um, we make it's that inclusion. We make you feel a part of. We make you feel a part of. All right. Citizenship doesn't necessarily mean you are you are citizen. It just means you as a person. You being included in it. And for the mental health part of it, because we're often ostracized and stigmatized, we don't feel a part of anything. We don't feel a part of anything. Couple, and if you add men, um, substance abuse, substance abuse on top of it, we feel less than. So the arts in this, if we're dealing with the arts, we put the arts in it, I'm sorry. It makes us feel more a part of, we have a voice. We have somebody that's gonna listen to us because every skit, that we've done as an ensemble, as a crew, was a true to life skit affecting someone somehow, somewhere, in some way. So I don't know if I'm on the right track with this because I'm dealing with two things. But um, <laughs> so I mean, that, I think that's where the citizenship comes about, becomes mm -hmm. about because now you're being heard. You're being heard. You may not be heard, be being heard directly, but you're being heard. So. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just, Bob, um, when we were talking yesterday, you said something about f feeling free, for it, being on stage and feeling freedom. And do you, I wonder if you could talk a little bit just for a minute about that. We're almost done here, but I wanted to, I want to get back to that because you used that word freedom. And I was just wondering if you could share that with the audience. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird, but uh, being on stage and going through a skit that, that you had come up with or someone else had come up with, with a mental illness um, situation that was so, so hurtful or embarrassing, but you go through something like that um, uh, and you do it on stage, um, it makes you feel, after you do it, it makes you feel like, whew, you know what I'm saying? And just, um, I let that out uh, of the hat. I let that out of the bag. I let it out of the closet. And, you know, I'm glad that I did. But on that point, and that's what I meant, felt free. But on that point, I agree with what Shannon said, that, you know, you can only go so far back into the hurt. And, you know, the further you go back, the further you go back, the further you go back for me is where all the pain is. And I don't think you could go as far back to a point where it will hurt you too much that you can even act, go on stage, or... or had to come out the way that you want it to be to be uh, um, shown mm -hmm. the proper way. Right. But um, for feeling free is is that's what it means to me for feeling free yeah. would be coming out of the closet and and showing people, hey, this is what happened. This is me. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not ashamed of it, and I shouldn't be ashamed of it. And this is what happened. You know, take take it for what it is. Learn from it because I did. And also, like you were saying before. Um, it's you, you kind of regain your freedom, but you also cast a spotlight on the other elements out there in the world that have been actors in your story as well, right? So, um, and those forces of oppression and those other kinds of dynamics. So, um, thank you guys very, very much for, for being here. Thanks to everyone um, for joining us. And like I said, I know it's a special group of people who would come out on a Tuesday afternoon to talk about arts and mental health. So we're part of the same tribe. And um, thank you again. If we, anyone wants to shoot us another question or follow up later, we're here. And we, if we do get together another show with Survivors of Society Rising, we'll make sure to invite you so you can come um, and, and watch. So thank anybody have a last word, Shannon, Liz, or Bob? Yes, I do. Um, I know that there's a pandemic going on, and but, but I, I love the idea that uh, Liz was talking about the acting to um, Zoom and things like that. So if anybody has uh, a deep pocket and would be interested in helping us, so we can do something like that and perform, you would get front row seats. And I'm not joking; we really could use the uh, <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Bob. Every seat's a front row seat on Zoom. On Zoom. And I too am looking forward 
to Les and Lucille coming up with something for us to do because I really miss I miss my acting buddies. <laughs> like I miss the experience. I miss everything about it. I mean, I like being a part of things that's bigger than me. Absolutely. And being able to, when I was watching the clip about Longworth Theater, I told you before I get goosebumps and I was just smiling because it was a powerful performance. The entire performance was a powerful performance. Even the performances we gave with Theater of the Oppressed, powerful performance. All right, especially the Joker parts when John and Liz was like, okay, what you're gonna go, what are you gonna do about it? You know? <laughs> And I really missed this, and I'm looking forward to us, to you guys first coming up with it, and then the rest of us just falling into place. I've spoken with um, James. She, he's like, well, when are we going to do this again? I'm like, I don't know. I'm talking to Lucille now. So, I mean, we are so looking forward to meeting with you guys. Thank you. So, Thanks. Is that it, Shannon? Yeah, I'm good. All right. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Bob. And um, hope you all, I wish you all well in your art making endeavors wherever you are in the United States. So stay safe and uh, keep the faith that we can create a better world together. Um, and thank you very much. All right. So long. <laughs>